What is a reserve currency? This is a question that's come up uh, when you're talking about the dollar and whether or not the dollar will be replaced uh, and there'll be a new reserve currency. This is a debated topic, but I wanted to break down for you what that actually means and why a reserve currency is different than a payment currency. All right, welcome to the show. Today we're going to talk about reserve currencies. Uh, apologize for my extremely boring office. I'm still waiting to move into my new office, which will have awesome lighting, awesome internet, and a very cool background. But today I am working temporarily from our local library who checks off the awesome internet box, but unfortunately is a little bit lacking in our wall decorations and the lighting is not exactly ideal. So my apologies if you want to just listen, you're welcome to. Uh, today we're going to talk about a timely topic as it comes up when talking about digital assets like XRP and Bitcoin. You know, will Bitcoin become the next global reserve currency? Uh, in my recent video, and I'll put a link in the show notes about de-dollarization, uh, we talked about moving away from a world centered around the dollar. And it's not yet clear what the new or next reserve currency or potentially currencies will be, but I wanted to break down for you what that concept means and why a reserve currency is different than a payment currency. All right, so nations, this is probably mostly a concept that affects countries and central banks, but when nations trade with each other, they generally trade using a reserve currency. You want to trade in something that is considered very stable, that is not uh, going to lose its value very quickly, and it's a pain in the neck if countries are trading in lots and lots of different currencies because then the price of things uh, becomes confusing to keep track of. If one day you're buying oil in yen and the next day you're buying it in euros and the exchange rates fluctuate, it's just a little bit tricky. Also, nations generally make profit when they uh, sell exports and they need to do something with that profit. And let's say you're a small nation on what we call an emerging market and your economy is very volatile, your currency is very volatile. You might be nervous in holding like your nation's wealth, your sovereign wealth, in a currency that's not terribly stable. So countries will hold their wealth in a reserve currency. And my understanding is that this term kind of comes back from when gold was used as reserves and uh, currencies like the dollar, when it first kind of launched, gold was really the currency, but gold is expensive and the pain in the neck to move around. So paper dollars were kind of used as a proxy for gold, similar to poker chips at a casino, that you know you go into a casino, you, you give them your real money, and they give you these poker chips that you go and uh, trade things around with, and you do your thing with the poker chips, but at the end of the day, you kind of cash back out for real money. It's very similar to how gold was arranged with dollars in the beginning, and that uh, the real money, the real reserve asset was gold. We don't have gold-backed currencies anymore, and so the actual currencies themselves have become reserves. And right now we live in this dollar-dominated economy, and the only entity on the planet that has the power to issue reserves of the global reserve currency is the U.S. Central Bank, the Federal Reserve. Uh, now, gold has not always been the reserve, the primary reserve. The first one was actually silver. Uh, the Back in the 16th, 19th century, silver dollar was the first reserve currency in my understanding, the Spanish dollar, but it was backed by silver. But post-World War II, which is kind of the era that we've all grown up in, the British pound uh, was replaced and the U.S. dollar has been the global reserve currency ever since 1944. So all the trade that we, are, we grew up in and the companies we know that buy and sell goods in the global marketplace, that is primarily all done in dollars because dollars is, can, here's the thing about exchange rates and currencies, like the value of things change if you have two floating currencies and you're swapping from one to another, but if everything's done in dollars, 
there really isn't an exchange rate. So even if you're a country like China that has a different currency, the yuan, but they're buying and selling in dollars and holding their profit in dollars, their global trade isn't really affected by exchange rates so much. Like they can kind of keep those funds separate and they can hold that profit in reserves as sort of a, you know, the same way that a regular person has like a 401k or an IRA or whatever. You have this sort of wealth that you hold aside in case you ever need it, in case you ever need to use it as collateral to borrow money or whatever. Nations do that too. They hold wealth in reserves in case they need to do stuff. And they want, you know, it's smart to pick the most stable currency you can for that. And that would, in most cases, is the US dollar. But the yen and the yuan and the euro are all also reserve currencies. They're just not the primary global reserve currency. So if, if a couple of nations decided that Bitcoin is their jam and they wanted to hold Bitcoin, as their reserves, which is basically what El Salvador has been doing, there's no rule that says you can't <laughs> use uh, a digital asset or Bitcoin as a reserve asset. You could even, you know, El Salvador could decide that they want to trade with another nation and do the payment in Bitcoin. Like, no one would necessarily stop them. The Bretton Woods Agreement was simply a group of nations all agreeing together that they were going to use the dollar as their uh, reserve currency. Uh, and that's why if you didn't, if you were a nation and you didn't want to do that, like no one says you can't, but you are at the whim if you are a buyer of a particular commodity or oil, you have to honor whatever the seller wants to sell it in. And that is sort of the significance of the petrodollar agreement where the US and the OPEC nations um, just determined together that oil would only be sold in dollars. So if you were another random country, like in Africa, and you went to Saudi Arabia and says, I wanna buy a bunch of oil, they were, were basically saying, well, you sure, but you have to buy it in dollars. And therefore you had to have dollars, you had to trade your currency for dollars, and that kept the value of the dollars high. And when the dollar stays high, it just makes sense for nations to hold their wealth in dollars because it's you know, a more valued asset relative to other ones. It is very likely that as we go through this process of de-dollarization that we will see a new reserve currency, but that doesn't mean that nations in the meantime can't use different payment currencies. Like you can pay for things in pretty much whatever you want as long as the buyer and seller both agree that that currency is acceptable. So we, we probably will see that quite a few currencies become used for payment, but generally there's only a few reserve currencies because they tend, you know, it's sort of like a, a big basket of floating currencies. Some of them will rise to the top in being considered the most stable, and the most highly valued. Uh, and those generally are the reserve currencies. It actually is in a nation's best interest if they do a lot of exporting to not issue the reserve currency because it makes your stuff more expensive in other places. It's called the Triffin Dilemma. And it's uh, significantly damaged US exports over the last few decades. So I don't see China or Russia being in a hurry to have their currency be the global reserve currency because um, it will hurt their ability to export to other nations. We are planning to see the BRICS nations issue a basket currency, which is kind of an, a weighted average of a couple of other currencies, but is also based on gold and based on some other commodities, um, but they have not announced any specifics about how that would work. I wouldn't be surprised personally if after the sort of fiat currencies collapse, we move back to currencies that are tied more closely to gold. Whether that will be considered a true gold standard, I don't necessarily know. But in history, when fiat currencies have collapsed before, people start to distrust these sort of paper money and they go back to wanting something that is easier to believe in and things that you can physically see and touch and hold, like physical gold, uh, they become the currency again. So we've been through this in history before where fiat currencies have 
done their thing and gotten out of hand and inflation has led to an over uh, supply and countries have reverted back after a collapse of a currency back to a gold standard. So it wouldn't surprise me if the next reserve currency had a very strong relationship with gold. Central banks around the world have been stockpiling gold for the last few years uh, and I would expect they are doing this in anticipation that that will be part of the next financial system. I don't know how well this video will age. <laughs> this change could happen at any time. And uh, unfortunately, I'm not an insider in the financial world to know exactly when that will happen and if it's based on some kind of trigger of events. But it is very likely we would see a new reserve currency in our lifetime that is probably based on gold, if not a gold and a basket of other currencies so that it is not dependent on one nation to issue it. This will affect the global supply chain though. There's just one kind of caveat to it. We haven't really had to worry about our stuff getting stolen by pirates <laughs> for the most part as, you, as we participate in this global supply chain. You know, a lot of stuff comes from China and Asia to Europe and to the United States. Well, if the US is no longer tasked with policing the supply chain, I'm not really sure who's gonna keep all that stuff safe and whether that means we move to more localized markets where things are made in your region. That might be a necessary consequence if the US dollar is no longer reserve currency and the US military is no longer in charge of policing that. Well, the global supply chain may change. So that's just something to consider as we kind of prepare to move to a new reserve currency uh, environment. How will that affect global trade? Now, in terms of opportunities for you and for everyone else, this might mean that you could be in part of local building a local supply chain and things that right now are, ex are imported into your region because it's just so much more affordable to do it that way. That may not be the case forever. Again, this video may not age well. We'll see how this plays out over the next year or two, but I would expect to see some big changes. If talking about this kind of stuff is interesting to you, please join me in my locals community called twostepsahead.locals.com. I'll put the link in the description. And we talk about all sorts of things related to uh, geopolitics, blockchain technology, and the future of money. All right, I will see you in the next video.